Good morning and welcome. My name is Dean Reuter. I'm director of the Federalist Society's practice groups, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this, the third and what I consider the best day of the convention. For those of you who are true, uh, true intellectuals, this is the highlight of the convention this day. Um, we have uh, had quite a convention, I think. All the feedback from the participants and from the attendees has been good, um, so I'm very pleased about that. We've had, of course, the four Supreme Court justices, uh, which is itself a highlight. Um, so although we weren't able to decide cases, we, we were able to issue some cert grants. <laughs> so look for those in your paper tomorrow morning. Uh, we've also had a fair percentage of the federal appellate court bench here with us, uh, and a lot of very accomplished and important law school professors and other public officials. So we're very happy to provide all of this to you. Um, but our, our panel this morning is a showcase panel on citation of, of foreign law. And it's my job only to introduce the moderator, who I believe is very well known to probably most everyone in this room, probably better so than myself. Uh, she was confirmed to the D.C. Circuit June 28th of 05 um, and had been a California Supreme Court justice. And rather than read her bio to you, which is available to you in your convention brochure, I I'm going to tell a story about her investiture, um, and I'll tell it very briefly. But her, uh, her accomplishments are so great that at her investiture ceremony, Doug Kamek, Professor Doug Kamek, who might be in the audience, delivered what I thought is one of the best speeches uh, that I've ever heard. It was simply hilarious, and it got funnier after that. Uh, but the whole premise was a suit that he was filing, and he's at this point addressing the Chief Justice of the United States, describing a suit that he's intending to file, the, the state of, and people of California against the D.C. Circuit for what he described as the loss of a national treasure. So. Uh, uh, she is, Janice Rogers Brown, is, of course, one of the most uh, distinctive, outstanding, and significant pieces of President Bush's legacy. And I think that'll be learned even more so in the years to come. So without further, please welcome just, uh, Judge Justice, Judge Janice Rogers Brown. <laughs> Well, good morning and welcome. I'm delighted and a little bit surprised to see all of you here. Uh, I know this 25th anniversary has included a lot of partying and I know a lot of you have been participating. So I have to assume that it's the distinguished panel and our provocative subject uh, that got you all up so early this morning. Um, so we will try to wake you up. Our topic today continues this year's convention theme focusing on American exceptionalism. Friday's panel asks whether America is really different from the rest of the world, more libertarian, religious, patriotic, optimistic, individualistic, and moralistic than other liberal democracies like Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Israel, or even Japan. Uh, I think the answer is yes. It's hard to um, be in America and know its history uh, and not think there's something a little bit miraculous about America. So as someone who is deeply devoted to the ideals for which I think the country stands, uh, I find it easy to think of America as exceptional. Not everybody does, however. Um, we have glimpsed that shining city on the hill for at least a moment. And the force of that vision um, was enough to raise the expectations of the whole world. I used to ask people uh, in some speeches that I did, what did Superman fight for? Uh, and people my age would smilingly and rapidly reply, truth, justice, and the American way. A few uh, years ago, when the last Superman movie came out, uh, they had changed this somewhat, and they said, truth, justice, and all that stuff. Now, I think uh, that reflects something about the way um, the rest of the world, and perhaps some Americans now, think about America. They're just a little bit um, embarrassed 
And so perhaps we're going to talk today about some of the reasons for that. Um, you can either um, think of this as American exceptionalism as being um, a focus on all that is positive about us, but like the negative of a photograph, there are people who see these things uh, differently and as just the opposite. So one question that we can ask ourselves today is, um, is the citation of foreign law something that we need to do? Should we be concerned about how other people think about us and how, uh, in fact, other Americans think about us? Or should we still think of ourselves as having something to offer the world um, and as leading in that regard? Um, there is a, another saying in my neighborhood, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and so the question today will be, um, are, is anything broken? Um, and if it is, how should we think about fixing it? Or should we um, content ourselves with going our own way, being uh, a power and somewhat of a pariah? Um, our distinguished panelists are going to tackle these questions and more. Uh, and they're going to do so, I think, in an enlivening and enlightening fashion. So we're going to get started. Each of our panelists will have approximately 10 minutes to outline general views. Um, and after that, they'll have an opportunity to respond to each other. Uh, and then you'll have an opportunity to participate. So, uh, and they're going to uh, go in, uh, in the order that uh, they are seated here. And so I'd like to introduce first Although uh, these are people who pretty much need no introduction. Um, but uh, our first panelist is Judge Frank Easterbrook. Um, and uh, he has served in the Solicitor General's office and as a law professor at the University of Chicago. But since 1985, he's been a judge uh, of the US Court of Appeal for the Second Circuit. He still manages to write very provocative articles um, to augment his provocative opinions. Um, his latest article, which is on a, the subject we address today, can be found in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, part of the National Student Federalist Symposium. It's entitled simply, Foreign Sources and the American Constitution. Judge, e How are you? OK, well. <laughs> I've uh, um, just been informed that uh, they've changed the rules on me. So <laughs> um, I'll adapt. Our first uh, speaker is going to be Professor Nicholas Rosencrantz. Uh, he at one time um, served as a law clerk um, to uh, Judge Easterbrook and um, also as a clerk for Justice Kennedy at the Supreme Court and is now a professor at Georgetown teaching constitutional law, um, as well as a course on the constitutional structure of judicial review. Uh, more important to most of you, he is now a member of the Federalist Society's Board of Visitors. <laughs> professor Rosenfeld. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here in such esteemed company. Judge Brown, of course, and my colleague Vicki Jackson at Georgetown, but particularly two of my mentors, uh, Akhil Amar, who taught me constitutional law at Yale many years ago, and Judge Easterbrook, who told me to forget everything that I had learned at Yale. Uh, I have often been in the audience for panels featuring Akhil Amar and Judge Easterbrook, and I've always found myself thinking, I'm sure glad I'm not that other guy. So today, as you see, I'm that other guy. In two of the most controversial cases of the past decade, Roper v. Simmons and Lawrence v. Texas, the Supreme Court relied on foreign law to help determine the meaning of the United States Constitution. Now, even though these citations were 
not very prominent in the opinions, even though there's not much of an indication that they necessarily changed the outcome of these cases, uh, people were up in arms. Uh, many people were up in arms. Many people in this room were up in arms. I'm going to try to explain uh, why, um, and I'm going to suggest something that we could all do about it. Uh, all right, so the basic reason is simple. The current state of foreign law generally does not tell us anything relevant to the project of constitutional interpretation properly understood. So for textualists, for originalists, the project of constitutional law is to determine what the text of the document would have meant to an educated reader at the time. Uh, on this view, the proper reference are constitutional text and history and structure. Simply put, it's just unfathomable how the law of, say, France in 2007 could be relevant to figuring out the meaning of this document in 1791, right? So, but of course, those who would cite foreign law do not accept these premises. Uh, rather, the current predilection for using contemporary foreign law to interpret the U.S. Constitution necessarily entails a rejection of the quest for original meaning, right, as a matter of logic. Simply put, those who would cite contemporary foreign law necessarily embrace the notion of an evolving constitution. Or, to put the point more starkly, the current predilection for use of current foreign law in U.S. constitutional cases is as a mechanism of constitutional change, right? Foreign law changes all the time. What this means, in effect, is that a change in foreign law can alter the meaning of the United States Constitution. And this, I think, puts the finest point on what is at stake here. So the notion of the court updating the Constitution to reflect its own evolving view of good government is perhaps troubling enough. But the notion that this evolution may be brought about by changes in foreign law um, raises fundamental issues of democratic self-governance. So when the Supreme Court declares that the Constitution evolves, right, and declares further that for the changes in foreign law affect its evolution, it's declaring nothing less than the power of foreign governments to change the meaning of the United States Constitution. Moreover, it might take only a single foreign country to tip the scales and make a difference, right? The, um, the court usually looks for a consensus among foreign governments, but at the margin, one country could make the difference, could tip the scales, right? There's no reason why a foreign country could not do this self-consciously. Indeed, France has expressly uh, announced that one of its priorities is abolition of the death penalty in the United States. Uh, yet, surely it would come as a shock to the American people to imagine the French parliament deciding whether to abolish the death penalty, not just in France, but also in America. After all, foreign control over American law was a primary grievance of the Declaration of Independence. King George III had subjected us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution. This is exactly what is at stake here, foreign government control over the meaning of our Constitution. Any such control is inconsistent with basic principles of democratic self-governance reflected both in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution itself. Indeed, the Constitution itself has something to say about constitutional change. Article 5 creates a complex, carefully wrought mechanism, really, for such mechanisms for constitutional change. All of these mechanisms require the concurrence of many different collective bodies, each with a different American geographic perspective. There's simply no reason to believe that in addition to these four express mechanisms of constitutional change in Article 5, there's also a fifth mechanism, unmentioned in the text, by which foreign governments may change the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. So if you agree with me that foreign and international law is generally irrelevant to the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, what should we do about it? What are our options? 
We can, of course, try to persuade judges one by one, and that's the, uh, that, that is the standard model of a Federalist Society panel, to try to persuade judges of the rightness of our views. But that is a, you know, bound to be a slow and incremental process at best. So in the interest of saying something dramatic at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, let me offer a more extreme solution. Uh, just for the sake of argument, let's consider for a moment a constitutional amendment that would forbid the use of contemporary foreign law as an aid to the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. Now, that might seem like killing a mosquito with an elephant gun, and conservatives are rightly very hesitant to amend the Constitution. Um, but again, to be pro provocative, let me suggest that the, uh, this idea may not be as crazy as it sounds. Um, so it seems to me there are actually several powerful arguments in favor of such an amendment. Um, as I've explained, this issue implica implement, implicates a fundamental question worthy of express resolution in the Constitution, an issue of democratic self-governance. So for my money, this is a, a topic that's eminently appropriate to enshrine in the Constitution. And in addition, I would point out that such a constitutional amendment would fit nicely within our constitutional traditions across a couple of important dimensions. First, this would be a sort of meta-constitutional provision, right? It would, uh, it, it would rule a certain method of constitutional interpretation off the table. Two of the 27 constitutional amendments so far have taken precisely this form. The 11th Amendment provides the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed in a particular manner. And even more to the point, the Ninth Amendment provides the enumeration in, in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. These amendments are rules of construction, rules of interpretation. Here the Constitution is giving explicit instruction regarding the proper methods of its own interpretation. Moreover, those rules of interpretation um, are, uh, these are rules that their framers thought should have gone without saying. Uh, in, in other words, these amendments, the 9th and 11th, um, were intended to restore or preserve what should have been the appropriate interpretation of the Constitution to begin with, their framers would have said. Uh, an amendment forbidding recourse to foreign or international law would fit within this same tradition. And it would fit within another constitutional tradition as well. So, the Constitution has been amended 17 times since the Bill of Rights. Many of these 17, and the most popular and successful ones, have been what John Hart Ely might have called representation reinforcing amendments. They have served to bind the government of the United States more closely to the people of the United States. One example is the 17th Amendment, providing for direct election of senators. But the most obvious such amendments are ones that extended the franchise. Think of the 15th Amendment, extending the vote to all races. The 19th Amendment, extending the vote to women. The 24th Amendment, extending the vote to those who could not afford to pay a poll tax. The 26th Amendment, extending the vote to all those at least 18 years old. By granting more Americans the vote, these amendments bind the government more closely to the people and ensure that the laws of the United States more closely reflect the aggregated preferences of the citizens of the United States. And my proposed amendment fits neatly within this constitutional tradition because it would do exactly the same thing. Just as excluding black Americans and female Americans and young Americans and poor Americans drove a wedge between American preferences and American law, Likewise, including the Germans or the French or the European Court of Human Rights as a U.S. Constitution, as a source of U.S. constitutional interpretation, likewise drives a wedge between American preferences and American law. By ruling such sources out of bounds, this hypothetical 28th Amendment, like the 15th, 17th, 19th, 24th, and 26th, would pull the U.S. Constitution closer to those who ordained and established it, the people of the United States. Finally, let me just suggest what such an amendment might say. The 28th Amendment might say, this Constitution was ordained and established by the people of the United States, 
And so it shall not be construed by reference to the present laws, customs, or practices of other nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rosencrantz. Um, our next speaker will be Professor Vicki Jackson. Professor Jackson is also at the Georgetown University Law Center. She teaches courses in constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and federal courts with a special emphasis on the Supreme Court, an institution with which she is familiar since she clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall. She is co-author with Professor Mark Tushnet of a course book on comparative constitutional law. And early in her career, she served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. Professor Jackson. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to participate in the conversation. I hope to provide some, uh, a broader context for the discussion first by very quickly reminding us of what U.S. practice has been, and second, by providing a very brief and necessarily simplified comparative perspective, that is, about how foreign constitutional courts use foreign law. First, on U.S. practice, reference to foreign law is a long-standing, albeit episodic, part of our own interpretive tradition in constitutional law. And I want to emphasize that comparisons to the foreign have been deployed in support of American exceptionalism, that is, to help illuminate distinctive features of the U.S. constitutional system, as well as to show commonalities of governmental power or restraint claimed to arise, for example, from the U.S. being a sovereign or from being a member of a community of civilized nations. Very few quick examples, starting with Marbury, which referred to British law in two different ways. First, to distinguish the U.S. system with its limited government under a written constitution, and second, to insist that as in Britain, where even the king could be sued, if the Secretary of State violated vested legal rights, the law would provide a remedy. Later in the 19th century, a case called Fang Yue Ting in 1893 called on the practice of other nations, the majority, to claim sovereign powers for the United States to exclude or deport aliens on any ground, the dissenters to say that the U.S takes nothing from the despots of Europe. In the early 20th century, the court's opinion in Jacobson in Massachusetts referred extensively to foreign statutes in upholding a mandatory vaccination law. And in Eighth Amendment cases, from the very first merits decision in 1879, foreign practice has been referred to as bearing on our judgment of what is cruel and unusual here. Finally, I will mention, though some of you may have heard me do this before, Justice Jackson's famous concurring opinion in Youngstown, which has two full pages discussing the constitutional histories of the UK, France, and Germany in the years leading up to World War II. He describes the Weimar Constitution in Germany as permitting the president to declare a state of emergency in which all individual rights could be suspended, a power Hitler used to persuade President von Hindenburg to suspend all rights, as we know, sadly, permanently. Justice Jackson concluded that while contem that contemporary foreign experience suggests that emergency powers are consistent with free government only when their control is lodged elsewhere than in the executive who exercises them, and thus supported his conclusion from other sources to reject the inherent powers argument made there. So point one, U.S. interpretive practices includes uses of foreign or international law both to define how we are distinctive and how we are similar to other nations. And the claim that this is something new is a myth. Next question. What do leading constitutional courts of other comparable Western liberal democratic nations do when they interpret their constitution? And here I'm talking about courts in Canada, Germany, Australia, India, South Africa. They adopt a somewhat eclectic approach to interpretation, just like most of the justices on our court, meaning they draw on multiple legal sources, including the text, 
original understandings of its meaning, their nation's own history, the Constitution's broader structure and purposes, the court's prior decisions, including in non-common law countries, the consequences of alternative interpretations, and in small ways, the experiences and practices of other nations. Now, some modern constitutions, like that of South Africa, specifically authorize the court to consider international or foreign law. But even in South Africa, foreign or international law is not treated as dispositive, but as a source of comparative insight. And there are cases where the South African court says, well, that's what international law says. That's what this country does. Our constitution is different. And even in Australia or Canada or the US, with no explicit constitutional text saying, look to international law, uh, the courts have, in fact, done so in interpreting their own instruments. I'm going to try and give you some very brief examples of different ways foreign law has been used. Um, now, Youngstown, we could say Justice Jackson's use of comparative materials was to understand the functional consequences of different interpretive rules. He wasn't discussing Weimar or the Third French Republic to say the U.S. Constitution should be interpreted like them, but rather information about their constitutional experiences um, was used to illuminate con consequential um, um, issues. Now, in South Africa, when their new constitution was framed in the 1990s, the framers punted on the death penalty. They decided not to decide it, let the court decide it. So the constitutional court gets a case in a criminal prosecution for capital murder. Is the death penalty under their constitution, quote, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment? The court decides, yes, very long opinion, many things considered, including the law of many other abolitionist and retentionist jurisdictions, including the United States. One of the points the court draws from the U.S. experience is a functional one, that the legal standard that court found for lawful execution was so complex and takes so long to exhaust that it was close to impossible to design a system that avoids both arbitrariness and delay. Second example from Canada, a decision in February of two, 2007 called Charcoui, uh, which illustrates another use of foreign constitutional experience to help answer a question put by domestic constitutional law. The issue was the constitutionality of a 2001 post-9-11 statute authorizing the detention of aliens believed to be terrorists upon a certificate that they were inadmissible on grounds of national security. The statute was upheld in large part, but one provision authorizing the use of secret evidence was found unconstitutional. Under elaborate Canadian doctrine that I do not have time to describe, when protected rights are impaired, the court examines whether the impairment is minimal in relation to the goal served. The secret evidence procedures were found to impair the respondent's ability to challenge the detention, and the court found there were less intrusive alternatives available, and here the court noted the special advocate system developed in the United Kingdom, which essentially involves a special counsel who reviews confidential material on behalf of the respondent but without disclosing it to him and raises questions to the court. This, the court found, was relevant to evaluating whether the Canadian statute minimally impaired rights as required by Canadian constitutional law. It thus used foreign legal experience to address a question of domestic doctrine. As the U.S. court did, for example, in the Jacobson case involving vaccination, was, was it reasonable? Or in a case like Mueller and Oregon, where the court looked at foreign law to uphold uh, protective legislation for women. Finally, there are many uses of foreign law to promote what I would call self-reflection about the meaning of one's own constitution. And I'm going to speak last about a case in Australia where originalism and ideas of fixed constitutional meaning have played a much larger role than in Canada. Nonetheless, foreign law is almost routinely invoked in self-reflective constitutional analysis, uh, according to Australian scholars, and I will draw here on work by Cheryl Saunders, a leading Australian constitutionalist. As you all, excuse me, as you all probably know, Australia, like the United States and Canada, is a federal nation. Like the United States and Canada, Australia has had judicial review under a written constitution for more than a century. The Australian Constitution provides very few rights. It is primarily a structural constitution. It has nonetheless recognized a limited constitutional freedom of political communication, which the court derived from the text of Section 24 of their constitution, which states, the House of Representatives shall be chosen directly by the people. In a 1992 decision, the court found unconstitutional a statute that prohibited paid political broadcasts in, the period, in a certain period prior to any election. 
And it considered, sounds familiar, it considered foreign law from a number of jurisdictions, including but not only the United States, to conclude that freedom of political communication was indispensable to representative government and by implication protected by the Constitution. Now in subsequent cases, the court extended this constitutional right of free political um, communication to require a limited defense in defamation actions concerning comment on public officials performance and here the approach taken in the United States New York Times and Sullivan was considered and rejected it was relied on negatively the court distinguished Australian culture from the US to explain this narrower defense because in Australia the court said we care more about reputation than they do in the United States. And we rely more on structure than on rights. Um, so you can see Australian self-understandings were developed, according to Professor Saunders, in explicit contrast to New York Times and Sullivan. OK, I'm going to conclude um, and come back to the United States. I want to suggest to you uh, that interpretive practice is, to some extent, importantly, self-legitimating. That is, what courts should do in interpreting the law is framed and rooted at least in part by what they have traditionally done. When the court was created under the Constitution and as the American people have continued to accept the court as a foundational part of our government, one might say that they accepted that in interpreting the Constitution, the court would do its work in the way it generally did. The U.S. court's practices of episodic engagement with foreign law and practice is not out of line with those of other comparable courts and helps to legitimate, I think, its continued engagement with foreign law or at least shifts the burden to those who would argue it's inappropriate. While it is not new for justices to refer to foreign law as a source in U.S. constitutional decision making, there is today considerably more in the way of foreign constitutional law than there was in the past, and it's much more accessible. The increased availability may tempt us into thinking we know more than we do. So there is a need for caution, which I'm happy to elaborate later. Our independent federal judges are always that. They are independent in their judgments. They are our national judges. Uh, being open to considering foreign law does not mean, as I hope I've illustrated, a commitment to converge with other practices, just as it should not mean a commitment to resist learning from how others have reasoned. Uh, rather, I think our justices should remain open to what can be learned about how our own constitution is best understood, including by reflecting on foreign experience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jackson. Um, our next uh, speaker will be Professor Akil Reed Amar. He is currently the South Mard Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both the college and the law school. He um, clerked for Justice Breyer when he was Judge Breyer. He is co-author of the Constitutional Law Casebook, Processes of Constitutional Decision Making, and other books focusing on the Constitution, including America's Constitution, a Biography, um, and the Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, and is hard at work on another which will be called America's, America's Unwritten Constitution, Between the Lines and Beyond the Text. <laughs> Professor Amar. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be back here on the 25th anniversary. I was present at the creation, and some of my friends uh, from that period are here too. Steve, nice to see you. Gary. Um, the citation of foreign law. Um, let's talk about treaties. They're a kind of foreign law. Now, to be sure, when they're made, um, the United States has agreed to them, but so has a foreign government, and then the United States might change its mind. You see, the foreign government still um, wants uh, uh, to stick with it, but, but we might have a different view. Now we're not talking just about citation, but whether this binds us at all, and if so, how. Now, from an international law perspective, a deal's a deal's a deal. Pactum sunt servanda. International law is the highest thing. You can't just get out of the deal because you decide that you don't want to. Um, but from the point of view of American domestic law, and uh, what American courts will do and other uh, organs of American government. 
the matter is rather different. Um, from an international law perspective, you see the treaty might be superior to our Constitution itself. Even if we amended the Constitution to explicitly repudiate a treaty, well, from an international law perspective, we're still in international violation, in delict. But from a domestic point of view, nothing could be clearer for a constitutional law person rather than an international law person that the supreme law of our land is the Constitution and the judges shall be bound by that. Um, so, um, and uh, so if we, the American people, now that might again put us in international delict, but judges are our servants, our agents, and if we want to go to perdition from an international law perspective, it's the judge's legal obligation to help us do that. Um, now, um, and, and so says the Supremacy Clause pretty clearly. What about statutes? They are inferior to the Constitution, of course, because for a very simple reason, structurally, the Constitution is higher law because it comes from the people as opposed to the people's agents. It's more democratic in its uh, origins and its, in its amendment process, which require supermajorities compared to ordinary legislative majorities. So much is understood. Um, uh, most people look at the Supremacy Clause and they say, well, the Constitution's first and then laws and treaties. But what's the relationship between laws and treaties? The traditional understanding is that they're on the same level. There are two kinds of uh, lawmaking, inferior to the Constitution, but on a par with each other, um, such that the last in time prevails. A treaty can basically repeal a statute, and a statute can basically repeal a treaty. Um, now, uh, I question this, actually, from a structural and textual and historical perspective, because treaties are less democratic in some very important ways than statutes are. They, they do not involve the House of Representatives, the People's House, um, in their making. Um, uh, the last in time rule is supported by lots of cases, almost all of which are about how a statute for domestic law purposes will trump an earlier treaty, even if there's a conflict. The statute may need to be clear to do so, because it shouldn't lightly be construed to put us in international delict, but, um, so there's a clear statement rule. But statutes trump treaties, and there are lots of cases that say that and hold that on their facts. Chinese exclusion cases from late 19th century, um, cases from um, uh, just the recent era. Now, there's only one case, actually, in which the Supreme Court says, oh, similarly, where it holds, actually, excuse me, not rather than says, that a, a treaty can displace a prior statute. And um, I, uh, I'll, if any of you knows the name of that case, it'd be interesting, because most, I, I mean, I'll give you a buck. Um, <laughs> I, you probably don't know the name of the case. I mean, it's a very obscure case. Um, so, um, I'm calling for that case to be rethought. Why? Well, I gave you a structure reason, because statutes are more democratic than treaties. Let me read the text of the Constitution. It actually has something in a certain order. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties shall um, uh, made in the authority of the United States, I would say in that order, Constitution, laws, treaties, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, maybe even in the District of Columbia. Um, um, <laughs> anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So here we have this um, gradient of uh, hi uh, this hierarchy, Constitution, laws, treaties, state constitution, state laws, in that order. Um, now, this sounds outlandish to many of you, but there is a doctrine, actually, um, called self-execution, in which we actually understand that treaties aren't really perfect substitutes for statutes. Here are some things that treaties cannot do that's generally understood. A treaty can't declare a war. It can commit us to getting into a war, but only Congress can declare a war. A treaty can't uh, raise a dime, can't impose an internal tax, only Congress can do that. That involves the House of Representatives. Treaty can't spend a buck. Only Congress, with the spending power, can do that. That involves the House of Representatives. A treaty cannot create a federal crime. Going all the way back to Hudson and Goodwin, um, we need a federal statute before there's a federal crime. Um, a, treaty a treaty cannot raise an army. Only Congress can do that. And actually, every two years, the army constitutionally lapses. Not the Navy, but the army does under the Constitution's Article 1, Section 8. Um, so um, I'm saying one other thing maybe treaties shouldn't be allowed to do, which is repeal a previous statute. 
may pass by Congress. They can require us to do so as a matter of international law. They can commit us to do so, but then the House of Representatives needs to follow up with a statute. Now, that's as a matter of the relationship to, to statutes, but treaties nevertheless are superior to state law and would trump existing state laws because we don't want an individual state basically putting us, um, uh, our nation, at, at risk. Um, and uh, so um, in that sense, the, the status of treaties properly understood is, is like a kind of federal common law. It uh, yields to a statute, but it trumps contrary state practice. Which takes me to um, another kind of federal common law. That's, that's, that's so much on treaties. Now let's consider another category of international law, customary international law. Tr maybe treaties, multilateral treaties that other nations have engaged, uh, have, have made, but we um, um, haven't joined it or we've joined it and not inhaled because we've you know, had, a, had a reservation uh, to some uh, a provision or um, the customs of other nations, to what extent do they bind us? Um, I would say surely, structurally, they shouldn't be higher than treaties, so therefore they shouldn't be uh, higher than statutes or the Constitution. Um, but I do think that actually um, they should, uh, 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 cu customary international law may inform federal judges who may properly create a kind of federal common law. There's no general federal common law post Erie, but there is federal common law in certain domains and it can be informed by state practice and international practice. And one of the reasons why you might want to have such a thing is you don't want an individual state basically getting you in a war with another country. Um, and federal courts are agents of the national government. When it comes to foreign policy, they really are um, subordinate in many important respects to the other branches of the federal government, to Congress and to the President. Um, but um, when, state, when individual states are misbehaving, federal courts can actually protect national interests. There is um, uh, and should be a kind of dormant commerce clause for the international commerce clause for our relations with foreign nations and federal courts can protect us against state exuberance. Um, now, uh, finally, a few thoughts on how um, we re uh, on international law as a kind of rule of construction. Um, well, all the way back to Chief Justice Marshall in a case called The Charming Betsy, he says, you shouldn't lightly read a federal statute to be in violation of international law. This seems to me sound. It's a rebuttable rule of, pres uh, of construction. A clear statement to the contrary would suffice. Um, we might even think that we shouldn't lightly read the Constitution to be in violation of international law. Um, uh, that's, um, of course, if the constitutional provision is clear, of course, the constitutional provision is adopted after the treaty and expressly designed to repudiate a treaty, then, then, then that's enough. Um, so international law does function properly as a clear statement rule. Um, foreign practice may offer us and has in the past offered us many negative lessons. As Professor Jackson began to mention uh, a couple of these. Let's take the question of sterilization. Can you sterilize people? Well, G Justice Holmes in Buck versus Bell says, yes, no problem. Even an innocent woman, never, done, never committed any crime, and her tubes can be tied because she's feeble-minded. And in Holmes' cruel phrase in Buck v. Bell, 1927, three generations of imbeciles are enough. That's 1927. Now in 1942, the Supreme Court says, you can't sterilize feeble-minded women. You can't even sterilize convicted felons. Skinner versus Oklahoma. Well, what's the difference between 1927 and 1942? Well, in a word, it's Hitler. Um, and his object, he gives us a negative object lesson of the dangers of a eugenic policy. Um, and sometimes this negative object lesson is on the surface of an opinion. Professor Jackson mentioned Justice Jackson in Youngstown about the dangers of uh, emergency powers um, informed by uh, uh, Herr Hitler. Um, um, sometimes it's um, more implicit um, in uh, Brown versus Board of Education and again a repudiation of a Nazi ideology of, of racial uh, and Aryan supremacy. Um, the practice of other nations has uh, finally uh, been sometimes a positive influence rather than a negative object lesson for the American people in the making and amending of our constitutions and in uh, properly in constitutional interpretation. Let me give you a few quick examples. The 19th Amendment 
the most democratic moment in American history, the doubling of the franchise, is brought about in part because Woodrow Wilson comes in person, shattering tradition, in person, to the Senate of the United States, because the President hadn't gone to the Capitol since um, uh, John Adams. Thomas Jefferson didn't like public speaking, so he just sent things in writing, and his successors followed that until Wilson came along. And he goes to the Senate and says, we should enfranchise women, and partly we should do it because women around the world are being enfranchised, and we are going to need to win the peace after this war, this World War I, and we're going to need to have moral credibility to be the leaders of the world, American exceptionalism, and we will not have that moral credibility if they let their women vote and we don't let our women vote. Um, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s gives us a series of amendments uh, getting rid of poll taxes, uh, giving this city a role in the Electoral College. And that's a civil rights thing because this city has a lot of black people in it, and that was understood as a civil rights measure. Um, and that's influenced by Martin Luther King's movement powerfully. That's why you get these amendments in the 1960s, which is in turn influenced by Gandhi, who of course is borrowing from Thoreau and the American Founding Fathers, so it, do, it, it does go both ways. Um, um, let me mention two final things. One is how we get rid of slavery in this country. We get rid of it initially um, with an Emancipation Proclamation that is issued in large part with an eye toward foreign public opinion, British public opinion in particular. If it's a war just about American Union, why should the British care about um, uh, the, 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 the United States cause. They may be perfectly happy playing divide and conquer, and, and they're thinking about allying with the Confederacy. But when Lincoln transforms the meaning of that war, it's no longer a war about union, but a war about freedom, he does so so that British public opinion will turn in behalf of the union and prevent the British government from siding with the Confederacy. Um, uh, now, we have an amendment that comes out of that ex uh, Civil War experience. It's the 14th Amendment. And I want to just conclude by reading you some conversations in Congress um, about that 14th Amendment and companion legislation. Our Bill of Rights, Nick Rosencrantz, who is my star student, um, said, you know, how can foreign practice change the meaning of an American Constitution? If you're an originalist, you can't really accept foreign practice. Well, you could if you thought the American uh, um, the uh, Constitution's text and history invited you to do so. Then actually it would be a reconciliation of originalism. If the American Constitution, for example, says, for example, no cruel and unusual punishment, um, that might be a reference to actually what's in fact usual, practiced at the time the punishment is being administered. So in 1787 they might be asking you to look at actual practices of 2007 to determine what is in fact usual or unusual. And if you could look to domestic practices to decide what's usual. The death penalty once was usual. Um, death penalty for 16-year-olds. It's no longer usual today, so maybe under a straightforward um, uh, appro approach, it might have been uh, uh, usual at one point and unusual at another point. Now, if that's true about um, evolving domestic practice, that it could be incorporated by reference um, in a constitutional provision, in theory it could be true of international practice. Um, we do care about the opinion of, of others. Here's something from the Civil War um, uh, Amendment debates. Because when we think about the Eighth Amendment and, or any other provision of the Bill of Rights, my invitation to all of you is to stop just thinking about the founding. You're looking under the wrong lamppost. I'd like each of you to think about three really important Bill of Rights cases that, um, in your mind. Pick, pick any three that you think are really important. My guess is that at least two of those three actually are about states or localities, not about the federal government. Almost all the important Bill of Rights cases actually involve states and localities. Strictly speaking, they are 14th Amendment cases about the incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states, and we need to understand how things like the Eighth Amendment were understood by the Reconstruction um, amenders um, uh, and not just the Founding Fathers. Here's um, what they thought about cruel and unusual punishment. This is from January 28th. 1867. So um, there's a bill that proposes to provide that no judge or other civil officer, state or federal, shall hereafter adjudge that criminals shall be punished by lashes or blows or by any other mode of physical torture. That's this bill and it's a companion bill to the 14th Amendment. And then here's Mr. John Kaysen, representative from Ohio. 
I want to add that a man who does not understand the dignity of manhood, the rights of citizenship, cannot understand the object sought to be accomplished by that bill. My object here is to protect those fundamental rights of Republican manhood. Hence the language of the preamble recites with whips and scourges. I ask any gentleman, see, because so far you might say, well, he's talking about American manhood, but listen. I ask any gentleman to point me to any country in the world governed, by, governed populi in this legislative branch, we care about democracies around the world, that imposes today physical chastisement, physical torture as the punishment of crime. There is no answer. No gentleman can point to such a country. Roscoe Conkling, the spoilsman for New York. Fascinating question. What is physical torture? Amazing. This is 140 years ago. What is physical torture? If the gentleman will tell us that, we may be able to answer. Kaysen, here I close. If he asks me what, is physical tor what physical torture means, he certainly understands that it applies to that species of punishment applied directly to the body and not to the usual modes of punishment by confinement and restraint of motion, imprisonment in fact, those punishments which are known to all civilized countries. This is a debate about the meaning of cruel and unusual punishment at the moment when it is redefined and applied against the states in the 14th Amendment. And this is originalist evidence that they do care about what civilized countries think and do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Amar. I had already uh, introduced Judge Easterbrook, and I said at that time he needed no introduction, so I'm not going to introduce him twice. <laughs> but for a judicial perspective, Judge Easterbrook. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge Brown. My, my apologies for getting the order all mixed up, but. Of course, everybody knows that Nick Rosencrantz and I are really the same person, so it, it didn't make that much difference in what order we, we spoke. Uh, I, I want to make a very simple point. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using foreign citations when, when they're pertinent, for example, to the interpretation of a treaty uh, or to avoid violating a treaty. That's the point of the charming Betsy. The problem arises when judges come to believe that they're entitled to update the Constitution, and then they start casting about for guideposts. The objection is not to using a foreign as opposed to a domestic guidepost, but to the belief that the judiciary can change an old document's meaning by reference to contemporary practice, here or abroad. All too many judicial decisions start with the belief that judges will flesh out old rules since the Constitution itself is not only old, but also short, if judges are to produce thoughtful and wise resolutions, they must have many additional sources to draw from, many experiments to monitor. Why not see how other nations have done things and assess whether those experiments have gone well or poorly? Notice the way I put this. I've assumed, as justices often do, that A, there is no answer to be found in the Constitution's own text and history, but B, the judiciary must give an answer. And when those conditions hold, people sensibly search far and wide. That's Professor Jackson's thesis. Last year, Eric Posner and Cass Sunstein gave a very thoughtful justification for turning to foreign sources, the Condorcet Jury Theorem. This famous theorem, which despite its name has nothing to do with juries, or with litigation for that matter, demonstrates that action based on the opinions of large numbers of persons is likely to be right, provided that the people being polled have even slight knowledge of the right answer. So if you want to know how many jelly beans are in a jar, and you ask a single person, or five, or ten, uh, the answer is likely to be way off. But if you average 5,000 person's guesses, you're likely to get a very accurate estimate. And what holds for jelly beans also holds for matters of science. If you want to know whether substance X will help cure disease Y, uh, the estimates become much more accurate as the number of people asked goes up. And what Posner and Sunstein uh, propose is that foreign nations be treated the same way as we treat people guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar. There are many nations, 
The answer that each of them gives may be the result of voting among millions of persons. Any one nation may go bonkers, but a consensus among nations may be sound. And if we turn to that consensus, we are less likely to be bonkers ourselves. That's the jury theorem. Now, of course, if that's sound, then justices should be willing to look at how foreign nations resolve all legal questions. Well, they aren't. No justice has gone on record as suggesting any such inclination. I mean, consider. No foreign nation excludes evidence obtained in the absence of Miranda warnings. Should Miranda therefore be overruled? No foreign nation applies an exclusionary rule for searches and seizures in anything like the U.S. form. Should Weeks and MAP be overruled? Most other foreign nations regulate abortion in much more detail than the United States, and many foreign nations forbid abortion. Should Roe against Wade therefore be overruled? Most other liberal democracies have serious penalties for defamation. Should New York Times against Sullivan therefore be ditched? Most foreign nations have official secrets acts. Should prior restraints therefore be lawful in the United States? Most nations of the world use fee shifting in all litigation. The American rule that requires parties to bear their own legal fees may be unique to this nation. Is it therefore unconstitutional? If one took seriously the idea that we should use constitutional law to make the United States more like other nations, then we would have to re-examine all of these legal issues. Resort to foreign law cannot be limited to capital punishment and regulation of homosexual conduct. Justices who limit their references to liberal foreign law flunk the basic requirement of neutrality in litigation. But when should judges use constitutional law to make the United States more like the world norm? The answer should be never. And the reason is that the United States lacks a judicial review clause. The reason why judges are entitled to make constitutional decisions is that the Constitution is real law, not just the result of an opinion poll or an estimate of current practice. That's the central point of Marbury against that guy. A written Constitution creates a hierarchy of legal rules. When the Constitution clashes with an ordinary law, the Constitution wins. Well, that's an implication not only of the Supremacy Clause, but also of the Amendment Clause, which disables legislatures from changing the Constitution without a national consensus. That means, however, and this is explicit in Marbury itself, that judges have the last word only when the Constitution is law and appeals to other nations' practices are not appeals to law. To put this slightly differently, it's never enough to have a theory of constitutional meaning. Anyone you meet in the street has one of those. The challenge is to have a theory of constitutional meaning that can explain why the judge's view must be binding, even when other people, equally learned and equally in good faith, disagree and why the rest of us should accept the view of someone you can't vote out of office. The founders' objection to George III was that no one elected him, and we were stuck with him till he died. They did not wage a revolution to turn the same power over to a bunch of judges. The point of the revolution... The point of the Revolution and of the Constitution was to allow the people to exercise choice through representatives who were held on short leashes. The longest term is six years. Marbury gives a reason why judges' views are conclusive in litigation, that the Constitution is higher law and constrains the democratic process. But the emphasis has to be on the word law and not on the word constrains. We need to take Marbury seriously. And this has implications for what counts as an admissible source. Foreign law, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, Mr. Herbert Spencer's Social Statics, law reviews, and the editorial page of the New York Times stand or fall together. None is better than another. When the judicial claim rests on interest balancing, on empirical predictions, on views about what makes for the life worth living, well, on those issues, we need to count votes if we're to live in a democracy. Now, 
<clears throat> at this point, somebody always says, or at least thinks, that a textualist view of judge's authority of the kind I've just articulated leaves us governed by a dead hand. And who wants to be frozen in the 18th century? Uh, well, yes and no. It's when the past has created a genuine rule that the judges can claim power. The old supermajority trumps today's temporary simple majority. The First Amendment protects the freedom of speech even when, indeed especially when, a living majority prefers censorship. And that's the dead hand for you. That's the constitutional structure. But on contemporary issues, there's just no decision waiting on hidden under a rock and waiting to be found. Then there's no dead hand, and what the Constitution gives us is indirect democracy. The living are entitled to decide. When things are up for contemporary debate, they must be open to vote as well. It's, it is weird to have decisions taken by foreign legislatures, which people can vote out of office, used by tenured officials in the United States as a reason why our citizens are forbidden to decide the same subject democratically. <clears throat> so one more time with my basic thesis. Foreign citations are one symptom of a deeper problem. Foreign law post-dating the Constitution's adoption is relevant only to those who suppose that judges can change the Constitution or make new political decisions in its name. And that supposition knocks out the basis of judicial review. My objection, then, is not to the source that a judge chooses to cite, but to the legal perspective that makes contemporary sources pertinent. It's a rhetorical mistake, as well as a legal one, <clears throat> to focus on citations to foreign law as if they were any different in kind from a pragmatic jurisprudence based exclusively on domestic sources. Uh, so I disagree with Nick Rosencrantz's 28th Amendment uh, because it's limited to foreign law. If we're to have a new amendment, uh, it should be clear that we are returning to Marbury and knocking out all contemporary sources. Now, having said that, I, I certainly don't want to deny both the propriety and the utility of understanding and relying on foreign sources of law of the United States doing that. The Constitution creates ways to do that. There are two ways to commit the United States to international norms. One, which Akhil Amar stressed, is the Treaty Clause. The President plus two-thirds of the Senate may bind the courts and citizens of the United States to a proposition on which they agree with other nations. The second is the Law of Nations Clause, which says that Congress may, and I quote, define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, close quote. And that requires a majority in each chamber plus the president or two-thirds in each chamber to override a veto. So there are express grants of power to align the United States with foreign law, but there are grants to the political branches of government, not to the judicial branch. There's no corresponding power in the judiciary to make any norm of international law binding within the United States. It's not just self-aggrandizement, but also contra-constitutional for the judiciary to insist that states or the political branches of the national government conform to international norms and understandings that do not meet the requirements of the Treaty Clause or the Law of Nations Clause. It, consider an example. There is a treaty forbidding uh, the execution of juvenile murderers. The United States is not a party to that treaty. And judges violate the Constitution by holding the United States to its provisions without the approval of the President and two-thirds of the Senate. Holding the United States to an unratified treaty and asserting that the political branches of the United States government are powerful, are powerless to decide whether or not to join the treaty is about as clear a contradiction of constitutional text as one can imagine. And this isn't a novel point, just a story, the good one of this guy's uh, presidential nomination, uh, Supreme Court nominations, made it, uh, made it two centuries ago. He wrote, and I quote, to alter, amend, or add to any treaty by inserting any clause, whether small or great, important or trivial, would be on our part a usurpation of power and not an exercise of judicial functions. <clears throat>
it would be to make and not to construe a treaty, close quote. And that view remains the law. So foreign practices and laws may make strong political or moral claims that the United States disregards at its peril. But the extent to which those norms govern is a choice to be made by political or moral suasion and not judicial decree. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge, Judge Easterbrook. Um, I know that the audience wants to have some time for questions, but I would like to give our panelists an opportunity for clarification uh, or rebuttals uh, before we get, begin, if anybody needs to do that. Anybody? Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to comment on Professor Rosencrantz's um, critique that considering foreign law means decisions of foreign governments are controlling. And, and I have great respect for Professor Rosencrantz's work, and, uh, but I, but I want to say that I find this not a recognizable description of the use the U.S. Supreme Court has made or of the uses I have seen in the foreign constitutional court uh, judgments. I don't think this is what the court was saying in either Roper or Atkins or Lawrence, and I certainly don't think they were adopting a Condorcet uh, a jury theorem approach uh, either, and I don't think they should. Uh, sometimes the rest of the world could be wrong, right? How many mothers and fathers have said to their kids, if everybody else is walking off a cliff, are you going to walk off a cliff? You know, but at the same time, if you see everybody washing their hands before they eat, you might want to find out why and think about whether the reason makes sense uh, within <coughs> your system. So um, I just wanted to comment on that. And on the question of whether any um, justice has raised foreign law as a basis for abandoning the exclusionary rule, I think the answer is yes. In the 1970s, uh, both Chief Justice Berger and then Justice Rehnquist uh, I didn't bring the citations with me. One was a dissent from denial of cert, if I'm remembering correctly, and the other might have been just Chief Justice Berger's concurrence in Bivens. But both of them noted the fact that in no other uh, I don't remember if they said English-speaking country or comparable country, was the uh, Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule applied with the same vigor and urged that as a basis for reconsideration. And if you're dealing with a constitutional text that talks about what's reasonable, uh, it seems to me there may well be a, const a textual basis for uh, asking that kind of question. Maybe I could. <laughs> okay. Can I just, um, is my mic on? Or? Yeah. Um, so just to respond to that, I, I, I wanted to be clear that I don't think that the Supreme Court has suggested these things are controlling. They were one of, you know, these citations were uh, a few of very many citations in these opinions, and there's no reason to believe that the case would have come out differently but for these, uh, but for these citations. Um, but that's always true of legal reasons in Supreme Court opinions, right? The Supreme Court gives you 20 reasons why the case came out the way that it did. And um, th there's never any way to know which one was the dispositive one, right? Whether if we'd knocked out one and there'd only been 19, the case would have come out the other way. <coughs> but it, um, if, that, if it is relevant, if it belongs in the judicial opinion, then at least in theory, it could be dispositive. It could be the one that made the difference. And so it's useful, academically at least, to talk about it as if it were, to imagine the case in which this is the thing that made the difference, and if, it, if the state of foreign law was different, we would have decided the case the other way. So it, it'll, it'll be um, impossible to prove that that's true in any given case, but it's nevertheless useful to think about it that way. Okay, um, I see we have a lot of eager, eager questioners lined up, so. Hello, is this on? <clears throat> Uh, Mike Paulson, University of St. Thomas. Good morning, Akil. I have an honest question about your view on the last in time rule. <coughs> May a treaty of peace supersede a legislative statutory authorization of war? Ah, excellent question. May a treaty of peace supersede a um, previous declaration of war? We might think that certain statutes 
um, properly um, lose um, their legal force um, as a result of a subsequent treaty, not because of a global last in time rule that a treaty always has the power to supersede um, a contrary statute, but that certain statutes on their own terms might sensibly lapse under certain conditions. Um, you might imagine, for example, a declaration of war sensibly lapsing, um, uh, uh, not merely as a result of a treaty, but a presidential truce, a battlefield truce. So, so sometimes, actually, um, yes, a subsequent treaty can be understood as a certain kind of fact uh, that um, who, uh, who on, uh, whose occurrence actually properly uh, uh, triggers the, the lapse of the early law by sensible understanding of the purposes of the original law, ratio, you know, cess uh, uh, et cess et lex, when, when the reason for the original law, don't you love Latin, um, uh, um, uh, 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 ceases, then the law might, might sunset, but not because of a general last in time rule that treats treaties as really the democratic or the, con the legal equivalent of a statute. Thanks. Hi. <coughs> uh, I'm Alex Kroll from Loyola University, Chicago. My pr uh, question is for Professor Amar again. Uh, I was a little confused, Professor Amar, as to what exactly was the thesis of your talk because most of what you said I seem to agree with, and I think most people here will agree with, that international, citing international law and political debate is perfectly all right, whether it's right or wrong. And that was, and you, most of your examples uh, were by the political branches. And then your last example was related to cruel and unusual punishment in the 14th Amendment. And you seem to imply that the 14th Amendment redefined what the Eighth Amendment was but I thought it perhaps expanded the Eighth Amendment to the states, but how did it redefine the meaning of the Eighth Amendment? And I just, what, what, what do you consider to be the main point that you wanted to get across? I, I was a <clears throat> the 14th Amendment not only applied the Bill of Rights <coughs> against the states, but changed the meaning of almost every provision of the Bill of Rights. That's a thesis that's developed in a, a book called the Bill of Rights Creation and Reconstruction. Um, let me give you three or four examples. Um, the original First Amendment Establishment Clause in part is about the rights of states to have established churches free from federal disestablishment. Congress shall make no law respecting that on the topic of an establishment of religion. And six states actually had established churches and the original First Amendment said Congress can't disestablish them. It has no enumerated power to do so. It's up to states um, option. That's not actually the understanding of the Establishment Clause um, and its meaning that prevailed uh, in the 1860s when this provision was applied against the states. Um, the uh, original First Amendment vision is um, very celebratory of juries. It's all about zenger and about people saying relatively popular things against an unpopular government. Our First Amendment tradition protects the sole dissenter. We're not so keen on juries. See New York Times versus Sullivan when a local jury is displaced. Um, and part of the reason is because Reconstruction understandings about the need to protect individuals even against hostile local majorities like unionists down south. So a new paradigm emerges. The Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, which I know no one in D.C. is interested in, um, but originally it's about a collective right of the people. It's about Lexington and Concord and Bunkers Hill and military stuff, but at the time of the 14th Amendment, it's re-understood as a personal right to have a gun for self-protection in one's home, actually, and the Congress actually passes a statute, the Freedmen's Bureau Bill of 1866, that speaks of, quote, uh, 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 rights to claim personal liberty, personal security, comma, including the constitutional right to bear arms. So not the people, person, so almost every provision of the Bill of Rights actually is re-understood. Um, the, the, the relevant legal question is what are the privileges and immunities of citizens that no state shall abridge? I'll give you one final illustration. Magna Carta actually um, it wasn't really about jury trial. It was about the rights of the barons, in fact. But the people at the time of the Constitution thought that it was about jury trial. And so they said, we believe in Magna Carta. Now, do they, did they believe in what Magna Carta 
really meant, we now know, because we uh, are we historians? No, they meant what they thought Magna Carta meant, which was a different vision than what Magna Carta originally meant. The framers of the 14th Amendment actually had different ideas uh, than the founders did, and those were the ideas in this political debate that are part of the legislative history of the 14th Amendment that originalists need to take seriously if they want to understand what the people of, um, of the United States thought when they basically re-adopted the Bill of Rights in the process of applying it against the states via the 14th Amendment. Uh, with due respect to the uh, federal bench and to Yale, I just wanted to thank Georgetown Law Center for giving us uh, some of the best it has to offer. Uh, and uh, in regards to continuing the debate between uh, colleagues, uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, Professor Jackson's appeal to kind of a consequentialism, especially in the Youngstown context where I think it reflected upon uh, a separation of powers analysis of a sort, where, where it spoke to uh, the structure of, of our Constitution and, and a, a consequential information uh, rather than an appeal to a foreign authority or foreign constitution itself. And how do you feel, uh, Professor Rosencrantz, uh, that um, uh, this would reflect or the possibilities for this consequentialism might still exist under your proposed uh, 28th Amendment? Uh, well, I guess the 28th Amendment would, uh, the 28th Amendment would suggest that um, you, those things are relevant, interesting to uh, the political branches, relevant and interesting when you're writing statutes, when the president's deciding whether to sign statutes, but when the court is trying to decide what the Constitution means, those things would s simply not be relevant to that project. Thank you. Yeah, Gary Lawson, Boston University. Uh, I'll address this to the newly merged entity, Frank Rosencrantz. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the judge aspect of, of that persona had a very impressive list of potential sources that should be struck from the universe of constitutional discourse, ranging from foreign law to New York Times editorials. The question is whether that list is too small. Um, what about the press releases that judges <laughs> issue along with their judgments that occasionally get bound together? Uh, and for that matter, uh, what about congressional enactments? Uh, law in their own sense, but as interpretations of the federal constitution? Um, are any of these other sources, the domestic sources, if you will, any more reliable, useful, and relevant as tools of constitutional interpretation than foreign sources like pronouncements from Australia, France, or Massachusetts. Wow. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I should ask that uh, Professor Paulson and Professor Lawson can get together and gang up on this. This is, this is part of a, the question which that Gary Lawson has urged in the past that stare decisis is unconstitutional for the very reason that was given in Marbury against Madison. If the Constitution prevails over the views of Congress, then the Constitution prevails over the views of, dare I say it, even John Marshall. And in the event of a conflict between the Constitution of the United States and the views of John Marshall or Earl Warren or even John Roberts, uh, the Constitution wins. Well, I, I have no, uh, no disagreement with that proposition. There, there is, however, the further question about whether it is ever permissible for judges to economize on information. That's how I generally view stare decisis. And I, let, let me put this in a somewhat different way. Most of the time when you sit down and come up with a new constitutional idea, you're crazy. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just like the proposition that most biological mutations are deleterious and they quickly die out. Uh, the fact that something has lived for some time, whether it's living biologically and surviving in us, or lived through the process of stare decisis, is some indication that it is less crazy than a randomly generated idea. So I, I do think that one has to take, serious, take more seriously the words of John Marshall and John Roberts uh, 
then one takes the words of the editorial pages of the newspapers uh, or other potential, or for that matter, even John Stuart Mill, but only because one has to be, judges have to be very careful when they say, I've got this bright idea to have some means of checking uh, and ruling out the possibility that their bright idea is uh, a light bulb that is soon to go. <laughs> Maybe just a, an addition to that comment. Um, John Marshall and John Roberts are uh, taking a crack at the same question that we are taking a crack at, right? So th they have, if, if John Marshall or John Roberts has tried to figure out what the meaning of the U.S. Constitution is circa 1791, we may well be able to learn something from that effort. We might be able to learn something from that effort even if the New York Times editorial page were to undertake such an effort, or a, a scholar were to undertake such an effort in a law review. These are people who are trying to answer the same question, trying to help us to understand what the U.S. Constitution means. But foreign governments are not trying to answer that question. The French government is not taking a crack at the meaning of the U.S. Constitution circa 1791. This is why that's irrelevant. and the efforts of scholars, judges, et cetera, or at least potentially could teach us something. <clears throat> Good morning. This is a question mainly for Professor Rosencrantz, who has proposed uh, being a constitutional law professor, a constitutional amendment. But um, uh, there may be a simpler solution for foreign law. I'm a proceduralist, so the change I would suggest perhaps uh, to consider would be in procedure in that Foreign law has a place in civil procedure, Rule 44.1, um, and for a very long time, or a fairly long time, um, foreign law was proved as fact. And changes in Rule 44.1 in 1966 changed it to a determination of law. But it's see, always seemed to me since this controversy arose that if you went back to the fact approach in which foreign law was had to be pled and proved, then that would solve the problem that you know, higher level judges at least wouldn't be introducing facts, not in evidence, and, and in their opinions. Um, probably it would be inappropriate for amicus people to, to import uh, facts in. Uh, you could still leave the idea of foreign experiences, but treat them as experiences, as facts, and they would no longer be considered law. And so the general controversy, are we citing to foreign authority, would go away. Um, so, you know, just a, a, a thought to go back to the, uh, the older approach of uh, foreign law as fact to be pled and proved. So that's an excellent question. Uh, I have uh, written on the topic of whether uh, federal statutes or federal rules can instruct judges, instruct courts in the best way to read statutes. And I argue that they can, and that that is a sensible project, and that Congress uh, should consider um, enacting a code of statutory interpretation. I don't believe, however, that Congress can tell courts the best way to read the U.S. Constitution. I think each branch of government has an obligation to read the Constitution in the best way it knows how, and therefore I think that a federal statute or a federal rule couldn't tell judges what sources to look at when reading the U.S. Constitution, just as they couldn't tell them not to look at the Federalist Papers or something. They also can't tell them not to look at foreign law, which is why you would need a constitutional amendment if you're talking about constitutional interpretation, I believe. Andy Schlafly from New Jersey. I want to build on the last question and ask Judge Easterbrook if rules of evidence could be used to keep a lot of these claims about foreign practices out of these decisions. And it seems to me a lot of these claims about foreign law and foreign practices are in fact unreliable. We hear claims that all these nations around the world have abolished the death penalty and then we pick up the newspaper one day and we hear that China has executed someone or Iraq has executed someone. We hear claims that all these countries around the world have abolished torture. And then we pick up the newspaper and say Singapore is about to, to whip somebody for some reason. So it, it seems to me a lot of these claims about foreign law and practices are unreliable and rules of evidence should be used to keep them out. 
But certainly the current rules of evidence don't keep out anything that is pertinent on the level of interpretation. The rules of evidence are designed for questions of adjudicative fact, that is, what are the facts in the dispute between the parties, rather than of legislative fact, which is what is the state of the world. Uh, that's one reason why judges who, in an antitrust case, cite an article in an economics journal aren't embarrassed by the rules of evidence, because the rules of evidence just don't speak to that question. Now, the, the broader question, could your question could be rephrased more broadly as, should or could Congress pass a law saying that particular things can't be considered in adjudication? And that actually happened at the beginning of our republic. Quite a number of states passed laws making it illegal for their judiciaries to consult foreign sources. It was part of a desire to break the cord to the mother country and establish a distinctive American jurisprudence. And I, I wouldn't have any doubt that that could be enacted as a, a matter of law, but one, one would have to be extremely careful with it, and, and I doubt that rules other than the 28th Amendment would be very useful, because if, if you remember the way I began and ended my talk, foreign law can be extraordinarily useful, indeed required, when we're considering a treaty or the Law of Nations Clause or the Alien Tort Statute which says that the United States, and this is part of Congress's power to enforce the law of nations, which says that the United States can provide remedies for certain offenses against the law of nations. You can't have such a law on the books and then say, and oh, by the way, judges can't figure out what the law of nations is. That just makes domestic law internally contradictory, and I don't think we'd want to do anything like that. <laughs> Um, Your Honor, um, I took Con Law 1 with Professor Mark Tushnet, and he shared his theory of popular constitutionalism and taking the Constitution away from the courts. Could you, could you perhaps stand a little closer to the okay. microphone? Sorry. Um, I, Your Honor, I would like to um, hear your thoughts about Professor Mark Tushnet's popular constitutionalism and taking the Constitution away from the courts. And um, Professor Rosencrantz, you made specific reference to the 17th Amendment. I was wondering what your thoughts are on Ralph Rossum's book on the 17th Amendment. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just did not hear the question. Okay. Mark, Mark Tushnet's book about taking the Constitution away from the courts and his theory of popular constitutionalism. And for, for Nick, what do you think about Ralph Rossum's 17th Amendment work? The I hate to comment on anything on which Mark Tushnet and Robert Bork agree. <laughs> because some, something has to be seriously wrong when, when that confluence occurs. The one, it would be very interesting to see if we can learn more about the actual behavior in other countries where there is either no constitutional review, France, for example. I mean, once a, a statute has been enacted in France, there is no constitutional review at all. There, the Conseil Constitutionnel in France can hand down advisory opinions before something is passed, but not afterward. Then there are places like the United Kingdom that have no constitutions, and places like Canada that have constitutions and judicial review, but the Parliament can then pass laws notwithstanding the Supreme Court of Canada's constitutional decision under the notwithstanding clause of the Canadian Constitution. And, and I have suggested in past writings, and throwing it out as a project for other people to do empirical research on, I'm very fond of suggesting that other people do empirical <laughs> research. On. Throwing it out as a question about whether in those four liberal democracies, the United States, France, the United Kingdom, and Canada, with totally different structures of judicial review, whether there are in fact different sets of rights in meaningful ways enjoyed by the living. Uh, it may be that what we see is that judicial review, despite all the arguments pro and con made in a room like this and in the, the Senate and in the pages of the papers, uh, is the power of judicial review is much overstated. Because if you see a substantial agreement in individual rights enjoyed in those four countries with completely different sets of judicial review, maybe you want to spend less time on this 
debate and wonder more about what are the sets of economic and political influences that bring about the freedoms we enjoy in liberal democracies, if you've learned that it isn't the courts. So I, I think this is a wonderful research project, uh, but I don't think we know, or at least I don't think I know enough to express an informed view on it. Uh, I have not read Rossum's book. <laughs> um, I think this panel is supposed to close at 10.30, so I don't know how much more time we have. This is it? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you to thank all of our panelists for doing such a wonderful job helping us to think about these questions, but you've already done that. So thank you. <laughs>